Well, hi everyone. Thank you for joining my talk today and also to the people who are watching over the live stream. I'm Deb Goodken and I'm the executive director of the FreeBSD Foundation. And so today I'm going to talk about FreeBSD. So is there anyone in here who's never heard of FreeBSD before? And I cannot see the virtual people. So is there anyone in here who's used FreeBSD? <laughs> Okay. okay, great. So I have 50 minutes and I'm gonna not lecture for 50 minutes. So I will talk, and, but also I'd like to make it a little interactive if possible. So please feel free to ask questions if you have any. So a little bit about me is um, I do come from a technical background. It's been a long time since I've done anything. Um, in regards to that, but I did come from the storage industry. I was a firmware engineer for many years and also uh, participated in different aspects of, of that field. And um, so operating systems is was really new to me or was when I joined the foundation. And so even though I have a technical background, um, I will not be covering the technical aspects of FreeBSD and it would be pretty difficult for me to answer, you know, technical uh, questions. But also, um, as you saw here, my Twitter handle is dgoodken, at, and uh, you could feel free to um, tweet me questions if you have. If you have any, you could DM them. And I have a whole team of people who can help me answer questions. And then finally, I'm just constantly learning and trying to learn more about the operating system and operating systems in general. And so I could teach uh, workshops, which we do around the world, as well as give talks. So what is my goal here today? It's really to spark your interest in FreeBSD and hopefully get you to try it and even contribute to the project. So I'm going to start off with a couple of stories. So uh, there was a young man, this was back in I think the late 1980s, which sounds like so long ago. And, uh, and I guess that was. And uh, he moved to the US from the Ukraine uh, as a refugee. He lived in government housing uh, with his mom, maybe some siblings. And um, he met a friend in high school and uh, this friend introduced him to FreeBSD and he fell in love with it. And so he learned it and he started playing around with it. And then in the early 1990s, someone was creating the startup and needed FreeBSD people because the infrastructure was going to be based on FreeBSD. And so he got a job with the startup, which was awesome and did really well. The startup uh, was Yahoo. They did well, extremely well. And then he had his own company idea and then he and a friend, they co-founded their own company and for a few years they were really successful and then Facebook bought them for $19 billion. And um, so, you know, it, it's just a great story of someone who just learned and well loved FreeBSD and was successful with it. And then another um, young person who I've met, I met a few years ago, I can't remember when, but it was in Europe and I was at one of our conferences and uh, he's from Iran and really young, but really, excited and passionate and just wanted to learn about FreeBSD. And so he slowly started getting involved with the project. And then he came up to me and he had this idea for a Google Summer of Code project. And I said, well, you should uh, suggest it and you should be a mentor. And he's like, no, I'm too young. Yeah, I can't do that. And I'm like, of course you can. Well, you know, we'll help you. There's mentors, there's people who will step in and help you. And he did. And then he started becoming administrator and then getting more involved. And then he ended up uh, moving to France. He got a visa and uh, got his master's in computer science and then he had all these job opportunities and it was all because of him learning FreeBSD and gaining these marketable skills. And, um, it, and, and the thing for him was, I mean, maybe he, he didn't make $19 billion. Um, I mean, I don't know anyone else who has, but, um, but he got to meet people from around the world. And 
Uh, he learned, he saw outside his own country things that actually he was uh, prevented from seeing. And uh, so it really got to open his eyes. And it was really exciting uh, seeing both cases, actually, of these success stories. And there's many more like those. And so, um, so to me, that's, those are examples of why you, you should get involved with FreeBSD. But now I have to tell you about FreeBSD and then the, some of the other reasons. So the FreeBSD world is really made up of what I view as, as these three components. And so the one on the top is, um, that's the actual operating system. So FreeBSD is an operating system. And uh, it, it came out of Berkeley. And then you have the, act, the, so that's the code, what you run. And then you have the project. And so, and actually I have a, a few, people in here from our project. And so those are the people. And they're the ones who uh, write the code, write documentation, do whatever it, you need to um, you know, support the computer operating system. And then the third component is what I represent right now is the FreeBSD Foundation. And so I'm not here to really talk about the foundation, but uh, I just want to give you a high-level uh, summary of it so you understand it because we're not a, an, an umbrella foundation like a lot of these foundations are. So if you look at like the Linux Foundation, and I'll use them as an example because they're the ones who are putting on this conference, which I actually really appreciate them giving me this opportunity to give this talk. Um, but they're, like, they're this foundation that has over 750 projects under them. and um, I truly don't know how they manage all of them because we just manage one. And, well, and actually, so let me be clear on that. So we're a separate organization. We don't manage the FreeBSD project. And we're a whole separate entity, but our whole purpose is to support them. We're a 501c3, so we're for the public good, a true nonprofit. Linux Foundation is what's called a C6, and it's, a, you know, it's IRS. Uh, classification, and it means they're a, a trade association. So we're different in, in that way, too. Uh, we are 100% funded by donations, and we're based in Boulder, Colorado. That's where I'm from. And, but I have people all around the world who's, who either work for me or uh, support our organization. We were founded 21 years ago, so we've been around for a long time. And I've been with them for 16 years of that. And our whole purpose is to support the project and the community. So what is FreeBSD? And it's funny because I, I moved this uh, graphic out of my talk. Um, and then I just put it back because, and I'm talking about the one on the top right with Tux and the cross out. And, and it's not because I don't like Tux. I think he's really cute. Uh, but it's like... Uh, people still get confused with us that they think we're a Linux distribution. And I've talked to people here at the conference and they'll be like, oh yeah, I haven't heard of that Linux distribution. And so we're always trying to uh, get the word out, to remind people, to educate people. And actually, I'll just go ahead really quickly here. Yesterday was a really good example. Microsoft came out with this blog post to talk about their uh, free credits for open source projects on Azure, which we're a big part of. And they actually had FreeBSD listed as the top project, which was really exciting for us until we saw, if you see in the red line, uh, that they they said FreeBSD is a Linux operating system. And it, well, everyone in our community went ballistic on that one. <laughs> and we actually reached out to Microsoft and they, they quickly changed it. Uh, which was great to see, but I, I do that because people still uh, just don't realize that because uh, Linux is so prevalent and there's so many distributions out there. It's, uh, so it's free and open source. It's a complete operating system. So what that means is that, so when you talk about Linux, Linux is a kernel, and then you have all these distributions which put the whole operating system together. And we are already that whole cohesive operating system. And so it's, so we have the kernel, user land, documentation, tools, everything that puts in that one package that you need to run your computer. Uh, we came from Berkeley. And we're used all over the world um, by universities doing research, corporations, and users like you. And we've been around for over 28 years.
Also, what is FreeBSD? I mean, it, it's an operating system, but really it's all of these things. It's a foundation, it's a toolkit, it's building block, reference platform. I've heard all of these, and it's for you to learn to use, to do research on, to innovate. You know, if you have an idea, if you have a product. So this is a really high level view of our family tree. And I actually stole this idea from Netflix when they were giving a talk. And I thought it was so funny. And he goes, but this is right, right? And I go, it is actually. And I liked it. And so it's, you know, FreeBSD came from AT&T. And so actually, so you had Unix developed it, AT&T back in 1969. BSD was the Berkeley version. They also contributed to it. That's actually how AT&T or Bell Labs actually got a lot of their innovation and contributions was from universities. And Berkeley was one of them. And, um, and then uh, in the early 1990s, then uh, they lost their funding and uh, didn't have the people really to continue supporting it. So that's when FreeBSD and NetBSD came around. Um, I don't have OpenBSD on here, but OpenBSD eventually uh, forked off of NetBSD. And then here's another, we, we have actually a longer history, which was fun to put together, but, um, but just the highlights of Unix 1969, and then the first unencumbered version of the Berkeley Unix was in 1992. So that meant unencumbered meant there was no more um, AT and AT&T code in it, so you didn't need the AT&T license. Uh, there was a lawsuit that most people know about that uh, from the Unix um, system lab who owned the trademark, and uh, they had a lawsuit against Berkeley, and basically, you know, saying you use our code, and they weren't because they had rewritten it all, but still, it's, it took about two years for them to... Um, to settle on that. And so because of that, um, I do point it out because a lot of people will say, well, why, why did Linux take off and FreeBSD didn't? And that was actually around the same time frame. And so most of the developers were caught up in that lawsuit. So instead of working on doing research and development, they were defending the, um, the operating system. So these aren't the only users of FreeBSD, but I put this slide together just to highlight recognizable logos and companies that do use FreeBSD. And the thing is, is that most of you use FreeBSD right now and you don't know it. So you may not have it like on your, like a PC, like most of you in here, or a lot of you may have Linux on your computer. Um, or Windows or, or Mac OS, but Mac OS and iOS were, there's a lot of components of FreeBSD in uh, those operating systems even now. And, um, and, it's really, and it's sort of cool because the whole Apple OS came from, originally came from Next, and Next was a, um, was a so Next was a long time ago, some of you may not know of Next, and, um, but, uh, they were a BSD house, and so when Apple bought them, uh, there were two like versions of operating systems, and they chose the next operating system because most of those folks that came over were were from Next. So it's a really interesting history, um, but a lot of the components are are still in there. And Apple um, is involved in FreeBSD, just sort of on their own terms, and um, so we don't always know when they're at our conferences. Netflix is a big user of FreeBSD, so whenever you're watching a movie, then it's being run on, free, on uh, FreeBSD servers around the world. And then you're, uh, many data centers around the world have FreeBSD because it's known for its stability and uh, reliability. And then PlayStations, uh, those are all FreeBSD based. So why I use FreeBSD, and I, I get this question a lot, and in fact, I was at a, a social the other night, and there's this guy who works for the Linux Foundation, and he's a big time FreeBSD user. He loves FreeBSD. And I'm like, why? You know why? And he's like, oh, my server, it's been up for over 2,200 days. And 
you know, and he's like, I don't even know if I want to upgrade it because I don't want to, you know, take it down. And um, and then, but he did ask me, like, so why why should people? Why do you think people should use FreeBSD? And so, uh, when people ask me that, the first thing that comes to my mind is really the the community. And if you're thinking of um, I mean, there's two ways of thinking of getting involved with FreeBSD. One is to use it, like companies will use it in their products or their infrastructure. But also a lot of people, especially like here, want to join a community, an open source community. If you're a student, like that's the big thing, get involved with open source. And there's thousands of projects. And so how do you even know which one to pick? And so to me, it's like, you know, it's what you're interested in. So if you're interested in operating systems. Um, but the other thing is really the community. What, if you're working, if you're volunteering for this community, this project, this product, um, you know, what do you want? And do you want people to be, do you care if people are friendly to you? Do you care if you have questions and people will be rude to you or be really supportive of you? So. I see uh, the latter in, in our community. And we're known for excellent documentation. In fact, we were uh, working on something. I have a, uh, another system here in my backpack that's running FreeBSD, and I was trying to set it up. I'm using a GUI that I'm not familiar with, and that's why now I'm not using it to present. And, but um, in order to connect it like to the Wi-Fi here, uh, I was able to find like that information online real easy. And so, and we're, and we're just constantly trying to improve that and add uh, more, more documentation and making sure our, our documentation is up to date. So, um, yeah, and then just all these other reasons. Well, another big reason too is the BSD license. And so that's why a lot of companies use uh, FreeBSD. And the BSD license is a permissive license, which means that you could do anything you want with it. And um, you don't have to give back your changes if you don't want to. And, that, and that's part of the project's goal, is really it's to be able to use it for any purpose that you want. And there's no strings attached. So our model, I know this is sort of a busy um, slide here. Um, my slides will be up on their website, I think under this talk, so you can go back and, um, and find these. But, uh, but we actually have a long history with how our projects govern and how it works. And so we've learned over the years and there have been improvements made, but it really still followed the philosophy of what uh, Berkeley set up. We have thousands of contributors. We also have hundreds of committers to the project. We have a, our leadership is made up of uh, nine elected core members and elected by the, the committers. And we do have a strong mentorship philosophy. And we don't have a benevolent dictator. You, we don't have one person who oversees the project, who makes all the final decisions. It's a, it's a democratic process. And then this is what, so this is like my view of how the project is organized. It's not an official org chart, um, and it's not actually the best one because it will just explain in a second. But what I'm always trying to show is how the foundation is totally separate from the project. And we're just here to support them, to guide them, provide input from what we're hearing of users, challenges of companies, things like that. And then you have the core team who's the leadership, and then the red boxes below are just part of that whole list below that of different functional teams. And, um, and so the red boxes aren't any more important. I just, I thought it'd be really busy if I made everything a red box. But we have um, all these different areas of folks with expertise or uh, just areas that people are interested in supporting the project. And, um, and so it allows people to like if you're really interested in security you can get involved with security and um, so to either participate in something that you're really interested in or participate in something that you want to learn uh, the core team like i said is a nine member elected body and they really oversee the um yeah like the administrative parts they they do lead and so they uh, they get a lot of input from us. They also hear what uh, folks want and what they need. 
And so they try to provide direction for the project too. And, uh, but then they also do enforcement of uh, rules, policies. Uh, if there's any type of conflict resolution, they will step in to help because you, you need that. And then this is showing the age distribution. This is a little dated by a couple of years. Uh, but what I'm trying to show here really is that we keep getting younger folks joining and it's really important so that previously will be sustainable. And, uh, but also on the right part, you do have some older folks. And the coolest part about that is that a lot of them are still involved with writing code. And uh, some of them are the original BSD developers. So they have all that history and experience and they're really approachable. So you can ask them questions. And then uh, we have releases and uh, we have two major or two types of releases. One's a major, so right now we just released 13.0 and then we have the minor ones. And so then the next minor one will be 13.1. And minor ones usually, so major has all the, the major bigger changes in it. Minor or point releases are usually like um, any of the security updates will be in those. And so those happen more often. And then we have two branches, one's current, one's stable. And so current is like when you want to stay with all the changes that, are, that have been made uh, and stable after it's been tested uh, for a little bit longer. Um, but on top, I talk about uh, the principle of least astonishment. Paula, that's a really big deal. Actually, a lot of companies appreciate that. Uh, the fact that we don't make changes just to make change. Like if things work, keep it. But, it, well, but if things work, but you can improve on it, do that. But don't change this, you know, to make changes. And, um, and so it's a really good philosophy. It really helps with the stability and reliability of the operating system. So there's many ways to contribute, and, um, and it's easy to get started. I put the URL here uh, that I suggest to go to to um, find out about how you could contribute. But really what I suggest is get involved with documentation because even if you're a coder, it, documentation is a great way to learn how FreeBSD works and um, also to learn the tools because you use a lot of the same tools with that. Uh, if you have a port you love, uh, we're always looking for maintainers or if there's a port or software package that we don't have, um, port it over and be a maintainer for that. You can go through our bug list and fix some of our bugs. And, uh, and then we have resources here that uh, we started last year, uh, like a FreeBSD 101 series, where every other week uh, we had someone talk about like a basic, er like an area of FreeBSD, but at a high level. And so we have all those recordings available. And then um, we also have a lot of other resources on that resource, that last URL. And so we have how-to guides. and all sorts of things there. Some of the exciting things that have been going on in FreeBSD, we did, I mean, so we were a little dated. <laughs> uh, we were still in SBN, but it worked. And, but we did transition to Git, and that's been really successful. And it's good, because, I mean, that's what people know. They're using it. Their companies and uh, young people are using it at their universities. So that's really helping. Uh, we've been known with the, having the ZFS support in FreeBSD for a long time, over a decade. I want to say like 2010 maybe. But anyway, we, um, we're now working with what was originally Linux on ZFS, and then they started the Open ZFS project. And so we're working together on changes. And so that, may, that means both projects get the improvements and features. Um, Cherry, I'll, I'll talk about in just a sec. And we are working on improving the desktop experience. FreeBSD is really strong uh, in servers. And, um, but a lot of people do use it on the desktop. But right now, it's not as straightforward getting it on your desktop as like if you bought a Mac and the OS is right there. And it just tells you exactly what to do to set it up. So we're working to improve that. And then the tools are. Uh, Got rid of the last component that was G, or, yeah, GPL'd. That was, that's the license that Linux uses. And uh, so it's a much more uh, modern uh, FreeBSD uh, tool chain that we're using. And Cherry is really exciting. And I won't go into detail of this, but it's a project through University of Cambridge. And they've been doing research with 
FreeBSD and security for for years. And so they have a partnership with ARM and ARM created this Merlot board and basically what they're doing is using a risk, uh, some of the risk architecture, um, inst the instruction set, instructions and, um, and making it really secure, especially like for IoT. And um, so it's all about protecting memory and they use what's called Cherry BSD as the operating system and that's free BSD based. And the really cool thing is they've been working on this for quite a few years now. And so they're in prototype stage uh, right now. And uh, when they come out eventually in production, the, I mean, FreeBSD is just going to be way ahead of the other operating systems because of this work. And a list of why companies use FreeBSD. I mean, really, the I'd say because of the, well, the history of innovation is a big deal. I mean, I hear that a lot. The high performance, the business-friendly license, and uh, ZFS, I would say, would be the biggest reasons. So to talk a little bit about Netflix, they gave a talk at our Euro BSD conference, which was just a few weeks ago. And so I put, I took the slide out of his slide deck, and then on the top I have his, um, I don't have the URL because it was too long, but if you just search for a serving Netflix video, if you actually just search Netflix and FreeBSD, I'm sure that you'll find this. And what he talked about was um, how they're going to get to transferring 400 gigabits per second off of a single server. And what I grabbed from this slide was just like right now they're at 200 gigabits per second. And so in his talk, he talks about what they're going to do in order to get there. So they already know how they're going to do it. We have a case study on our website, and I have the link at the bottom. And so... Um, basically, they provide these servers all around the world. They use off-the-shelf components, and they're getting their performance by a lot of the tweaks that they can make in the actual kernel. And the cool thing about, uh, so some of these numbers on the top right are now a little dated, and so that's why I included his slide, just because we, at peak, they were transferring the 90 gigabits, but now they're at 200. And so they're getting high throughput, and they upstream almost all their changes, but they, are, they can keep their little proprietary prior, uh, changes themselves because of the BSD license. But they up, upstream most of their code. They give back also financially to the foundation by supporting our efforts. And they also follow the current or the head branch. So they really keep on top of the changes. And it's actually really cool for us because we get their changes right away. And so we benefit as a project from them, but, and then they benefit because we start testing all their changes. So it's, so there are a lot of benefits because of that. Other features of you know, FreeBSD, the ZFS and UFS. Uh, D-Trace, a lot of people love FreeBSD because of it. It's a, um, it's a way, basically, to um, you know, see what the kernel's doing. Uh, you can do performance analysis, and, but also debugging without it affecting performance at all. So it's real time uh, that's, that's running while your operating system's running, but it doesn't affect the performance at all. Jails was created in FreeBSD. Jails was one of the original container solutions, and people still use it. Beehive is our own hypervisor. Uh, TCP IP, we did not uh, develop that, but it came out of BSD. And so now FreeBSD is used a lot for reference platform for that. And Caps, Capscom is another security um, framework that is also part of that whole Cherry project out of University of Cambridge. So I talked a little about, about the desktop and how it's people... Um, you know, we're not known for um, you know, being the best operating system for your computer, personal computer, but a lot of people do use it. And so there are these distributions out there that a lot of times when I meet with people and they want to try FreeBSD, then I suggest one of these, um, these desktop distributions. In fact, I, so now I'm playing around with my 
uh, computer with FreeBSD, and so actually I'm sort of attracted to Hello System. I think it's really intriguing, and so I'm going to try that out. But I also suggest that people, when you're going to try an operating system, that it, you know it's even with Linux, it's a little painful to you, you know to set it up because you have to go in there and change like the configuration files. You have to know what's the Wi-Fi, what's where the devices is not, and it's not like in plain English of what you're you're setting up. And so, I think it's really important, even people who are non like not technical, um, or they're not going to go into computing, that you understand the foundations of your computer. You really should. And so when you go through that exercise of configuring your system, and you have to read up on what you're going to do, and um, but you have it set up, and now you understand, like, oh, I have this hard drive, and it's mounted. What does that mean? What's the memory? How do I access it? That then it's it really gives you that foundation for using a computer. So, so if something fails, then it's easier to debug and understand what's going on. It's just like if you have a car, you should know you know the basics, basic mechanics of a car. A bicycle, same thing. You should know how to change your own tire and like some of just like the most foundational things. So I think it's the same thing with computers. Containerization this is some of our options. We're still working on more solutions. Right now we don't support Docker. Actually, uh, someone from my community is going to come up and talk a little bit. And, um, and he does, he uses the Linux later a lot. And that allows you to run Linux binaries on FreeBSD. And what we're he finding and hearing is a lot of times people say those uh, binaries actually run faster on FreeBSD than Linux. So. But we have these other um, projects, too, going on to do containerization. And so I do, I'll, I give this talk a lot of times at Linux conferences. So is this a Linux conference? Yeah, it's put on by the Linux Foundation. It's called Open Source Summit. But still, really, it, what's the focus? Is It's Linux, and, um, and, and which is fine. And um, I mean, what I hope is maybe I'll get people interested in trying out FreeBSD. But here's. Uh, some of my reasons of why I think that we should work together. Not necessarily develop code together, but um, you know, why, as a Linux developer, as a Linux sysadmin, you know, whatever you do with Linux, why you should learn a little bit about FreeBSD. And so it's, it's like anything that you should just understand other, uh, it, I mean, if you're an operating system, system specifically, you should understand other operating systems. You should understand the pros and cons and come up actually with your own pros and cons. Because you may say, you may try FreeBSD and go, I, I don't like it. But then now you know exactly why. Why don't you like it? And or you may like it. And so and you may actually bring over like some of those things that you do like. So it really helps you with Understanding like your own philosophies and um, and whether you want to incorporate some new ones, and we also learn from each other and we do work together. There's there was a hardware Intel hardware issue a few years ago, security issue, and actually we did come together to um, work on uh, security uh, mitigations or workarounds in our in our code, and so that was really important to be able to work together and support each other on that. And you know, we have different coding uh, methodologies and philosophies. And uh, you know, like I said, we have the Pola one. We, Linux is a very like hacking mentality, which is fine. People like that. Uh, and we're not. We're a more like think through it first and, um, and, and suggested to people get uh, input from others. We're a smaller code base. Like, we have like 5 million lines of code in our kernel, and they have like 37. Actually, it may have dropped, but, but I mean, that's just the kernel. So if you're looking at, if you want to learn about operating systems, ours is a much smaller code base to actually learn from. And I had this quote at the end that I put here because I just thought it was so interesting from someone I read online, just the fact that it made that that person felt like by learning FreeBSD, it made them a better Linux administrator. 
And Les led him in a show before I had Vincent come up and talk a little bit is, uh, so these are my reasons why I think you should contribute to FreeBSD. And um, like I said before, it's a really inclusive community. So if I were to contribute, and I do, and I'm still learning, and I feel like people are just helpful. And, um, and sometimes I feel really, it, it, it's so normal to feel intimidated. These people have been working on this for some of them for 28 plus years. And, um, and, and, it's, and operating systems are pretty darn complicated. And, um, and so, but people want new people they, and they want them to contribute. So they're really supportive. And, and like I said, it's a great way to learn systems programming and operating systems because the source code is available and it's a smaller um, amount of code to look through if, if that's what you're, you're doing. Uh, another thing too is because we're a smaller project, it's easier to make a significant um, contribution or difference. And uh, for example, we had an intern a few years ago and uh, for some reason, we had them working on Risk Five, and there were only a couple of people who were working on that at the time. So he actually became like one of the main Risk Five people on the project, and so it wasn't like he had this newbie who was doing this. I mean, he was able, he got mentorship and learned so much. And so he just grew into that role. And so now actually he's graduated from the university and he's a main risk five uh, contributor on the project and one of the leaders, which is really cool. So that was cool to see. And then in folks are approachable. Like I was saying with Kirk McKusick, who's been around, we call him a dinosaur. Uh, <laughs> he's, but he's, he loves talking to people. And we are democratically run. So, uh, you don't have to go through this like lieutenant hierarchy to get your changes accepted. Now, it doesn't mean that we have low standards. It just means that, um, you know, usually there's a few folks who will review your code. It might be committed. It could be rejected or, you know, it could be rejected. Um, and it could be uh, reverted too. So, uh, so things are reviewed, and it, but it's just more of a flat system, and you have more people who will step in from those specific areas who, um, who will help give advice too, which is really nice. I think that's really helpful. And oh, I did say that was last um, slide before I'm gonna have Vincent come up, but. Um, so we have 10 minutes, and I, yeah, I saw this conversation on Twitter. There's this guy, well, it's actually a group of folks, FreeBSD Help, and I love how they come in and they just support people. And, and they're not the only ones. Actually, Vincent, who's gonna talk, he's another one who is just like, who will answer questions right away, who will recognize contributions and you know, retweet them and promote them, and so it's really nice to see that when we really don't have like a marketing team within the project. So I asked uh, Vincent, who is actually local here and he's part of our community, if he would just come up and talk about his experience with FreeBSD, why he got involved with FreeBSD and some of the work that he's doing, because I think it's really exciting. And um, so I will let him come up and let him, I'll just leave the slide up. I don't think it'll be distracting. And um, I'll put my The, the slide is perfect, uh, helpful oh, community. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, my name is uh, Vince, or Vincent Milam Jr. If you go and actually try to find me on social media, um, I go by uh, Darkain, D-A-R-K-A-I-N. And uh, I got into FreeBSD a little over a decade ago. Um, because I was working uh, at a small uh, e-commerce shop for a while, and we had been using different flavors of Ubuntu and Debian for well over a decade at that shop. And we needed just, uh, at the time we were dealing with um, distributed databases using RayDB glare clustering, so we were, um, had that across multiple nodes, and we needed to have a good, solid way to do backups uh, without taking down the cluster or anything else like that, or you know, you know, affecting um, our production machines. So I came up with this idea since we were already using uh, FreeNAS, which is based on FreeBSD, 
um, uh, for just normal file backups using Samba shares. I'm like, well, this has this thing called jails that you can just install kind of like a virtual operating system under it. Let's just experiment with that, try to get MariaDB running on it and see if it'll connect to the, the cluster. Because um, as uh, Deb mentioned, we also, uh, FreeBSD also has ZFS. So uh, if we can get data replicated to there, we could take snapshots and then restore the snapshots um, back into production if something happens. Or we can take those snapshots, put them over into our dev environment, and you know, take basically production data into dev to work on it. Or we can also ship those snapshots offsite to other data centers for, um, for backups. And uh, we did that, we set it up. Um, the Galera cluster actually works across Linux and BSD at the same time. It works great doing that. And uh, that was a huge success for us. And then over time, we were noticing that uh, whenever there was any issues with the cluster and we needed to do maintenance work, uh, it took about half the amount of time to do that work on the FreeBSD system than it did on the Linux nodes. Uh, and the, the, the more and more that, you know, the, this, uh, we had the hybrid environment, I think for about two years or so. And over time, it was just, we noticed it was simpler, quicker, easier to do that. Uh, in this particular shop, we didn't really have Linux gurus or BSD gurus at all. Uh, most of us were, were, you know, Windows administrators. That was as much administration task, uh, knowledge as we had, because we were all software engineers, and we didn't have a DevOps team or an ops team or anything like that. It was, like I said, it was a small shop. Um, but uh, since we decided, or we found out that it was, um, you know, the FreeBSD system was acting uh, more reliable for us, uh, we started doing a performance analysis on it afterwards. And again, with the database and being an e-commerce shop, the, the time that it takes to load a web page is very, very important. Uh, that is one of the most critical metrics for um, you know, like e-commerce platforms. Uh, many, many years ago, Amazon actually put out a paper, a white paper, talking about how many milliseconds of latency drops their revenue by how many millions of dollars. Uh, because people will just leave a web page if it takes too long to load and then they're, they're not buying your product. And uh, running uh, MariaDB on uh, the FreeBSD system, um, we were noticing that the time to first byte for the database connection was cut in half which means that was a huge reduction in how long it took the web page to load for our end users. And uh, the, the more we explored with that, we decided to eventually just to move our entire infrastructure over to, uh, um, uh, to a full FreeBSD system for uh, the, the databases. And then from there, we decided to start making that same change for uh, our Nginx nodes and our PHP application nodes. And, um, you know, from there, we just kind of, uh, you know, kept moving forward and it, it just worked great for us. And then, um, you know, that was, like I said, maybe 10 years ago that that changed, you know, eight to 10 years ago because it took a couple years to do. And then nowadays, I've just kind of hung around the project and especially the past two years, I've been more involved with it because uh, I'm a huge fan of ARM processors, ARM, you know, single board computers. I want to make sure that everybody has access to technology regardless of what their like social uh, economic background is. And having like a little $35 or even a $5 Raspberry Pi because there is a $5 model. And um, historically, the Raspberry Pi Foundation primarily supports uh, Linux. But I, I think that you know, users should have a choice and there should be, uh, you know, there, there's some really cool things you can do with FreeBSD that doesn't work well in Linux, especially like with uh, ZFS storage. And so I've been um, trying to, uh, you know, just do uh, contributions and fixes and testing a lot on uh, ARM systems to make sure that, you know, everybody can have access to technology. It's like, is there any uh, questions or any other stories you guys want to hear about? <laughs> Uh, the ZFS code base is virtually identical on the two at this point because, um, uh, as Deb, Deb mentioned, there was multiple branches of ZFS. That's when they introduced the, the feature flags. So there was a ZFS on Illumos on FreeBSD. FreeBSD was based on Illumos. And then Linux took it in a completely different direction, implementing uh, different features. 
And then uh, um, everybody decided to get together and re-merge those code bases together so that a lot of the FreeBSD code was integrated onto the ZFS on Linux project. And then uh, from there, it was rebanded back to OpenZFS, which was the initial intent, intent when ZFS came out. But you know, they kind of diverged. But now that they've brought it back together, it is one shared code base uh, for those two operating systems. And I believe this year, the, um, the Mac release should also be on that same code base. And I believe there's also work to bring Illumos back to the, the core OpenZFS code base as well. So that way, everybody will have the exact same code base on all operating systems. And there's even uh, like one person that's doing it primarily solo to bring it to Windows as well. So ZFS will be everywhere, pretty much. The amount of drivers that Linux has? Right. Yeah. So for, uh, there, for the questions about Linux drivers porting them to FreeBSD, um, from a technical standpoint, yes and no. It depends on the driver. Uh, there's a lot of uh, KPI work, the, um, the kernel, whatever. I don't remember exactly what it stands for. But if you look at the, um, the GPU drivers for AMD and Intel, uh, those are actually the same drivers used on Linux. Uh, there's a, a, a compatibility layer there to use that code. And I believe a lot of the work for the Intel Wi-Fi driver right now, the, a the AX200 drivers, I believe are also the, sh the same shared drivers for uh, Linux as well as I think OpenBSD already has them. And so uh, there's a lot of work to make the driver uh, interfaces a lot more similar between the different operating systems so it's easier to report that code back and forth. Does it support firmware blobs also? Does it support what? Firmware blobs. Uh, uh, does FreeBSD support firmware blobs? Uh, yes, um, I do believe several of, especially the Wi-Fi drivers, do come with uh, the blobs. Um, I can't say 100% for sure because I haven't gotten too far down into the, the kernel side of things. But if I remember correctly, at least the, um, I want to say the Realtek Wi-Fi drivers had, had blobs with them as well. Because, yeah, oh, that's one of the beauties of FreeBSD is that uh, with the, the, the way the licensing model is set up is that you're not required to, you know, submit the code ba back. Like you can have you know binaries or code, and either is acceptable, and that's what's allowed to innovation for systems like you know the, the Sony Playstations, for instance, that was up on the slides earlier. Okay, thanks. And so, um, so that was really just to share a story. Actually, I had someone who could answer more of the technical questions too, which is really always really helpful. Um, and so, I, I it was a few weeks ago. I met a young man who uh, he worked at a big company. Who he said actually uses FreeBSD. And he said, I really want to get involved with FreeBSD because he wasn't actually part of that group that used FreeBSD. And so then I said, oh, I'll send you information and always trying to get new people involved. And so then I just opened up a Google sheet and, or a document and then just started going down like, if I were to get started with FreeBSD, what would I do? And so I just sort of put this list together. And I thought if I had time, which uh, it looks like we've run out of time here, um, I would actually give you a tour of some of these websites. But, uh, you can come back to the PDF or take a picture to get a lot of these URLs. And I just felt like this was just a good step-by-step -step way of learning FreeBSD. Um, LPI, the Linux Professional Institute, also does a certification for BSD. And if you actually go to their certification page, they actually list all the components of what you need to know for the test. And so I think that's actually a really good way of learning FreeBSD too. You could just like go step by step to, it just gives you something to have to figure out. And um, so anyway, so this, this was my step to step guide. And then also I have resources here. Some of it's overlap. There's two excellent books. Uh, one is actually, if you're interested in the design of operating systems, the darker one. Uh, is written by Kirk McCusick and a few others, and uh, that goes into all the detail of the operating system. The one on the right, the absolute FreeBSD, is a great one for like for me, the users of FreeBSD when I'm setting it up, 
and Firstless Edmonds. So uh, those are two books I would highly recommend. Right below, we have the resources. We do have a magazine, a journal with lots of free BSD articles in it, which is actually applicable to anyone who's using like a Unix-like operating system. And then I have resources on the left. Um, the handbook is excellent. Uh, I mean, really, <laughs> I've sat down on the couch like on a rainy day and just started reading the handbook. And it's actually really, it's an interesting read, which is unusual. Uh, for you know, technical documentation, but it's really helpful too. So, uh, so you have that. And then the other thing I would suggest is the history of FreeBSD, because that's told by uh, Kirk McCusick, who is part of that history. And he's always really interesting to listen to as well as he just knows it all. So that's it. I, I'm not sure if we have, it, we did have a little bit of time <laughs> being told to stop. <laughs> But um, but I will be around after too. And like I said, if you have any questions, uh, you can always tweet them. You can DM at dgoodkin at on Twitter, and or just grab me. I'll be around for a little bit. And that's it. So thank you so much for sitting through this and uh, joining us with this the story of FreeBSD. <laughs> <clears throat>